wish to have something that was as funky as the psychedelic Miles Davis, as cosmic as Donovan, as sonically challenging as the Future Star of London and what we've done as a as, as a as a sonic production here. <laughs> Times really have changed now. I see it as a parallel time to the 60s. In the 60s, there, was a, there were people experimenting with drugs, spirituality, food, Eastern religion, and that is kind of what's happening now. Now is a glorious opportunity to be free and to say, hey, I am not shackled by any constraints. If I am truly experimental, then I can go anywhere I wish. And in a way, the amorphous androgynous moniker began to be very important because for me, it represents the ability to really break free from any constraints of what the future son of London represents. Brian, I do like to play with the idea that we are, we can be a different band every day in a way. We're not limited. You know, I never really understand. I, I do respect bands that stick with the sound, but I, I don't understand it because um, I feel that I could start a new band every day and it could be entirely different. Um, but that wouldn't necessarily make a good album. So the idea, in a way, I must say, that the psychedelic, although psychedelic doesn't call back 1967 to me, it doesn't mean anything to do with that for me. Psychedelic, for me, has become a convenient moniker for me now to say, look, I am going to experiment. I'm going to do what the hell I want. I'm going to have songs which go into like birds and ambient breakdowns and breakbeats or live drums or fuse things. You know, for me, it's we are now in a period where the musician should and could be very liberated. <laughs> It's very easy to talk about the big bad industry, I don't really go there. I think musicians are silly for allowing themselves to get into a situation where they think they're being pushed into what they have to make. More for them, because you can fight, you can stick up for what you believe. The way in which Brian and myself, as the nucleus of the Amorphous Androgynous, have worked on this particular project is that we come together for the live aspect of the band. Normally we have the ideas, the loose ideas of the tracks down and we invite our brotherhood of merry musicians to come and play their parts. It's almost like an open day and they all come down and they play with us and we love those days, they're really great. And we kind of sit back and we kind of inspire them and we play them records and we sort of get them to think about the way in which they're playing. Um, and then basically Brian and I take those files away and we become nerds. <laughs> And I really hate that part, actually, because it's hard work. And at that point, Brian and myself, we, we spend countless hours by ourselves. Now, I'm not going to work like this next album, because this, this part of the process has driven me mad on this record. And at points, I actually thought I was going insane. Can you tell? <laughs> she used to live on the east side of town. She High and dry, um, I've been fasting for five days. And uh, I got up and I walked and I said, I did an olive oil enema today and I fasted for five days. And I was spouting out all this mad stuff that I've discovered. And I just started singing just because I wanted to. And part of the amorphous thing was me saying, look, I don't care if I'm not a good singer. I don't care about that. What I care about is communicating. So I'm gonna try and communicate because I've got a voice. When I first, sung it, it seemed really preposterous. It seemed like, what the hell is this, some kind of Mick Jagger? What the, what the, what the fuck is this, man? But you know, after a week, it's like, actually, this is pretty good vocal. And I tried to redo it, or tried to make it better, and the more I tried to make it better, the more I went, you know what, that was a good, that's one of those moments I'm talking about, where I was liberated. How did I get there? But I was liberated, and you know what I've come to realize? All the great music, 
is written in moments of liberation. <laughs> The Witchfinder came about because Brian and myself became obsessed with the Wicker Man film. And, and this resonated very strongly with Brian's childhood fear of witches <laughs> and my getting back in touch with pagan traditions. So there was a whole marriage there, in a way, of, of the two. There was a marriage between Brian and myself on that, so we kind of really got into the Wicker Man, and um, we got into the soundtrack of that, and um, so we kind of wished to do something that was that was based loosely on the idea of pagan sort of pagan system, or the idea of the idea of a modern witch hunt as well. Um, conceptually, it was based on the idea that we believe the witch hunt is now happening as well. The witch hunt used to happen very overtly and used to actually burn people physically. Now we believe that the witch hunt happens within the media. People are witch hunted for espousing way out theories or philosophies or, or theories or ideas that threaten the agenda of what's going on. And those people are basically burnt, but they're not burnt in, in that way. They're now burnt in the media. They are basically belittled and made a mockery of so that the small man on the street just never gets in touch with the true reality of the work. All he sees and believes is what he reads in the media. So he believes that so-and-so is a madman, a nutter, a blah blah, but if he had the time and inclination he might find out actually that that person has hit upon certain truths. So the witch finder was based on that idea. Thank <laughs> you.